Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. So we're just going to give it uh, sort of the typical uh, 60, 120 seconds uh, to allow everybody an opportunity to, uh, to dial in. So bear with us uh, for a minute, and we'll get started here uh, shortly. But again, thank you for joining us. Well, I feel like uh, that's uh, that's enough time. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping uh, items, a few reminders. Uh, this recording uh, and the uh, the PowerPoint deck will be sent out to uh, to all of you uh, following the webinar. If you have questions or comments uh, during the session, please submit them through the uh, either the chat or the the questions tab that you have. Um, if we're unable to get to any of your questions during the uh, the webinar, we'll certainly uh, follow up with you, uh, you know, one on one uh, afterwards. And then to uh, to make certain that you're on the the right webinar, this is MSR 101. We'll be reviewing uh, M MSR principles, advantages, and dis disadvantages, and then some of the key portfolio evaluation drivers. So with that, uh, let's take a moment to. Uh, Get to know the uh, the presenters. If we could uh, go to the uh, presenter slide, uh, that would be great, Danielle. Excellent. So I'm Bill Sheriffs. I'm the head of MSR Services uh, for MCT and Sales Operations. Again, happy to have you all uh, join us this morning and this afternoon. We've got uh, three of our MSR industry experts with us. So starting off with Azad Rafat. Azad is our senior director of MSR Services. Um, he is an industry veteran, extensive uh, MSR expertise, including direct MSR portfolio management and oversight, cash flow management, done a lot of sophisticated modeling throughout his career, doing a lot of work with us on our models as well over the last uh, you know, couple, two, three years, and uh, really getting that model to a, you know, a very, very robust uh, place. Also, um, we have uh, David Burris. David is our sales director of MSR Services, another industry veteran including capital markets, mortgage insurance, and subservicing, and including uh, strategic planning. Uh, we're happy to have you with us, David, as well. And then our longest tenured member of the MSR Services Division, we've got Natalie Martinez. Um, she oversees our evaluations uh, uh, process and all of that work with our, our analysts. Uh, she is also our resident MSR Live and EBX expert and con continues to be directly involved with driving many of our, our model uh, enhancements. So those are our uh, speakers uh, for this uh, webinar. So let's uh, get into the uh, the agenda. So for the agenda itself, you know, we uh, specifically designed it to appeal to all levels of sophistication, from foundational elements of MSR all the way to the more strategic. So we're going to get into uh, pretty much a little bit of everything uh, during the, this uh, this session. You know, I wanted to just make one point that our philosophy at MCT is that optionality is essential. If you're not currently approved with the GSEs, we would encourage you to obtain your approvals with the GSEs. If you are approved with the GSEs but not approved to retain servicing, we would encourage you to pursue those approvals as well. Just that flexibility and that optionality allows you to, to pivot. Uh, based on you know what's happening with the market, so uh, so we would we would encourage that. So as far as the agenda, we'll talk a little bit about what is MSR. Uh, we'll get into some of the disadvantages and the uh, advantages of retaining MSR and the the value of holding that asset on your balance sheet. Uh, the the two accounting approaches. We'll talk about that. The three valuation types: fair, market, and economic. And then we'll get into the valuation drivers when we do our fair value analysis or our uh, economic value analysis, what are some of the key drivers behind uh, that analysis that we do? And then how do you achieve price continuity, you know, relative to MSR? You know, you've got the grids, you've got street rates, you've got market pricing, you know, how, how should you think about all of those uh, different elements? And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the current market, you know, what's happening uh, currently out uh, in the market today relative to servicing release premiums and then also bulk MSR activity. So. Fairly uh, robust agenda. We're going to be covering a lot of ground here, and uh, so let's get into the uh, the first slide, Danielle. All right. So 
Starting off uh, with what is MSR? You know, mortgage servicing rights are created when mortgage loans are set, sold into the secondary market. At that point, the servicing asset becomes a distinct asset. It's separated from the whole loan. And uh, you know, relative to the trading and liquidity, you can see the second bullet point here, the vast majority of the MSR that's traded uh, for a long period of time, and that uh, remains the case today, uh, the underlying servicing is with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and, uh, and Ginnie Mae. Uh, whether those loans are sold via the cash window for Fannie and Freddie or securitized, or securitized with uh, Ginnie Mae, that really drives the vast majority of the, of the trading activity uh, relative to uh, MSR. And you might think to yourself, well, when I sell my loan to an aggregator, there's a servicing release premium. Well, there's a reason for that, because those loans ultimately end up with one of these three entities as well. Even though it's going to an aggregator, they're packaging those loans and ultimately selling those loans uh, into uh, the secondary market. So um, but that's really what mortgage servicing rights is. And uh, technically, that asset is owned by the GSEs. But as you all know, the GSEs are not structured to service. They don't have an infrastructure and their charter doesn't allow for them to service loans. So they actually have to hire a third party to perform the function of a servicer. And, you know, if you think about, you know, what the responsibilities are for a servicer, they're fairly extensive. You know, you might think about, boy, if I could retain 25 basis points in servicing uh, for a Fannie and Freddie business and even 69 basis points for a Ginnie Mae business, that would really add to my cash flow. But you also have to think about the responsibilities that are involved, and they're extensive. You know, there's customer service, there's collection, there's processing of payments, loss mitigation, investor reporting, data integrity, accounting and reporting, and those are just a few. So the responsibilities are, are fairly extensive that need to be uh, certainly uh, thought out. So again, that's uh, sort of where we're starting. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Zod, to Zod to get into some of the the, really the main areas around the uh, disadvantages and the advantages of retaining MSR. So I'll turn it over to you, Azad. And Azad, you're on mute. I always do that. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just like in any business, uh, there are rewards and risks, uh, pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. Owning MSR is no different. Uh, some of the highlights, and that's why we see a lot, there are more rewards than risks. That's why we see a lot of companies uh, joining uh, into owning MSR. And actually, we started seeing that push uh, translate late 22, when a lot of money managers, hedge funds, independents, uh, even banks and credit unions uh, who never retained any MSR uh, started to retain that MSR. And we're seeing that interest, you know, basically explode into uh, towards the end of last year and beginning of this year. Some of the advantages for owning MSR is it's the minute you start owning that MSR, it generates a positive cash flow, and that that is generated from the fee income, the servicing fee income. And as you grow, and that obvious uh, service fee income will grow as well. And also that servicing income uh, can be used uh, or offset any risk from uh, an economic downturn or production downturn, which we've been experiencing over the last two years. A lot of the companies who owned MSR, particularly the ones uh, owning, you know, a billion and higher, that cash flow income coming in from the servicing income helped sustain the business, help that continuity to go on and help retain staff. That way, when the cycle returns of higher production, they could easily transition into uh, tra uh, pr uh, production again. So definitely, it's an asset to have. And you could think of it as an annuity income stream. I mean, you could have that asset sitting out there and generate uh, regular revenue. And also it gives you alternative secondary uh, execution, i.e. if you originate a loan and you can't sell it to an aggregator, 
you don't have to sell it at a loss or a low value. You could retain that for better days. So it gives you that option to capitalize on such assets. And at the bottom you know, of the list, but yet it's one of the most important ones, is in, it increases the uh, franchise value. Uh, the company itself, the value itself will increase because that balance sheet increase. That will determine how much valuable that company is. Some of these advantages, obviously the operation itself is cash intensive, but also depends on how you manage that business, whether you service the loan in-house, whether you service the loans outside, so you give it to a subservicer. That will dictate how much cash you're going to give up. And obviously, uh, staffing you know, also depends on uh, the subservicing agreement that you have or you, whether you service it yourself. Uh, and it's also resource intensive. It requires a lot of monitoring, compliance, uh, and uh, uh, reporting. Uh, there are some cash advance risks and responsibilities, i.e. tax and insurance, let's say, if the borrower if the tax and insurance payment were below what the tax amount remitted to the uh, tax authorities, then uh, the servicer obligation is to advance that tax payment to the service to the tax authority while you collect it back from the borrower. So you have to have that cash readily available. Loss mitigation responsibilities. You have to work with the borrower, with the agencies to make sure everything is filed and following you know the rules that the agencies and regulators have set out and there are also some compliance related to basel 3 cfpb regulations all these things have to be considered and then aside from that there is a legal exposure potential legal exposure whether uh, company related or borrower related if the borrower file for bankruptcy if uh, some other legal uh, risk that you have to deal with. So those could add to the uh, overall cost of the operation, but it is manageable. And depending on the operation and the business strategy, you can mitigate those expenses and risk and have a profitable business. Uh, I would like to turn it to uh, Natalie to go over some of the additional accounting uh, considerations. Thanks, Azad. Uh, so, yeah, so there are two main types of accounting methods for MSRs, uh, one being low-com, which is lower of cost over market, and then the other is fair value. So with the low-com method, this is really a more conservative accounting approach. It really focuses on the potential losses rather than any recognized gains, uh, which can be quite beneficial in maintaining, you know, a conservative financial position for the MSR. Uh, and because it's predictable and, and it's the more stable approach, uh, this method is, you know, often recommended for those just starting off uh, with retaining MSRs, as it's often easier to implement and maintain and can require fewer resources to manage. Um, and then also, you know, by not adjusting the value of the MSRs upward, you know, to reflect any of the current market values, uh, those using low-com method can also avoid any unnecessary volatility and the effects of any temporary, you know, market fluctuations. Uh, which again might not represent, you know, actual long-term value of the asset. Uh, so low-com is, I'd say, a more measured approach, and it also includes, you know, amortization in the analysis as well as considered impairment. Um, but as our clients grow, we do often see them uh, tend to make the switch to fair value. So, so what is the the fair value approach? So fair value, you know, like the title says, uh, this is when you're receiving a fair value analysis from a third party and using that value to book the asset, um, which this can ultimately uh, achieve, you know, higher balance sheet valuations. Uh, however, you know, because, you know, fair values can change from month to month, so let's say even if the portfolio is staying exactly the same, you know, just due to market volatility alone, you will be experiencing that volatility on the valuation of the portfolio. Uh, so why do people make the switch to fair value? Um, uh, one, you know, fair value accounting is really considered the more dynamic approach and it provides a more accurate reflection, um, again, based on current market conditions. Uh, fair value accounting also makes it easier to compare financial statements across the industry. And you know, with its you know, enhanced transparency on the value of the MSR portfolio, 
we really see, you know, as our clients grow, um, making the switch to, again to uh, fair value accounting method, and, and this is really just to align with regulatory requirements or, you know, what might be considered industry best practices. And then one final note is that for the fair value accounting method, you know, once you uh, choose fair value accounting, you're really locked in. So you can go from, you know, low com to fair value, but once you switch or you choose fair value, that's kind of it, and you, you can't go back to low com. Uh, but so with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Azad to kind of talk about, um, you know, why we need MSR valuation. Yeah, yeah and, and, and before that, thank you, Natalie. And before that, going back to the low com and uh, fair value, the low com approach, uh, just like uh, Natalie had mentioned, is a, a conservative approach. That's why we see a lot of credit unions uh, adopt that approach uh, more than uh, banks or independents. Uh, the other thing, once you lock the MSR value, that initial capitalization rate, uh, that would flow into the balance sheet. So since then, from that point on, that balance sheet level is going to be declining over time. So that's why you see those companies who adopt the low comp continue to add loans to maintain that balance sheet level. Unlike in the fair value accounting, that balance sheet can go up and down. And that's what gives more advantage to larger portfolios uh, if you have a fair value account because that balance sheet could expand or change rapidly. But then at the same time, once you get to a point uh, in the fair value, like when it peaks right now where we are, uh, there is the risk of a downturn and that could impact the balance sheet level as well. Uh, in regards to why uh, MSR valuations are necessary, they are necessary because one important thing is you do not want to have a surprise on your hand. So that's why uh, we advise clients uh, to have a regular valuation. It doesn't have to be monthly, especially if you're starting out uh, fresh. A quarterly will suffice, semi-annual, and but I will not recommend to go less than semi-annual. And the reason is anything could happen uh, during a year. And we've seen that take place in, with few clients who opted for the once a year or once every two years. The value had shifted by then dramatically. And then when they take that into, you know, translate that into the P&L and balance sheet, it's a shock to the system. So it definitely pays to have regular value, uh, you know, uh, provided to you. This way you will ensure uh, all the compliance, all the regulatory compliance, all the auditory compliances are met. At the same time, it eliminates any balance sheet and P&L surprise uh, that could impact the company financials. Uh, the MSR has... Right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, companies uh, grow dramatically since 2020 because they started retaining more loans. Because And once they started retaining, they realized the importance of having such an asset uh, on their books. It kept them afloat during 2023 and up to now, and they benefited from that. And that's why we see a lot of those companies continue to retain loans, and actually we're seeing more companies who never retain start realizing the importance of that asset and retaining more loans. And also at the same time, when you get those monthly or quarterly or semi-annual valuations, it helps you understand the direction of the value. The, it also helps you understand uh, the levels of profitability and value of that asset. And also, by doing a regular valuation, just like I mentioned, uh, you're meeting the auditors and regulatory body requirements, which some of them will require that you have to have a regular valuation for the sole purpose, eliminating any potential risk down the road. And I'd like to turn it over to Natalie, back to Natalie again to discuss some of the drivers and market, uh, I'm sorry, valuation types. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the three main uh, valuation types. So um, 
starting off, we have market values. So you know, as the name suggests, uh, this valuation uses current market assumptions. So these are, could be the same assumptions we use when we're brokering a bulk sale, for example. And you know, because these assumptions can vary greatly depending on you know the current bulk market, they can be quite volatile. And up next, we have fair value. So this is the value used for the accounting purposes, as we previously discussed. And again, these are um, based off of third-party valuations, and these are ones that we would uh, typically provide to clients. So you know, when an MSR bulk sales are actively trading, I'd say fair value is you know fairly in line with market value. Uh, however, when you know the market's not active, uh, for fair value, we actually have to make assumptions and provide valuations as if it were, so as if the bulk market was active. And, and this is just because fair value analysis is not entirely dependent on the current bulk market. Uh, so for fair value assumptions, uh, what goes into place is, you know, we are taking into account what current market, you know, uh, value assumptions are, but we also participate and, you know, receive quarterly broker surveys to verify that you know the fair value assumptions we're using are also in line with the rest of the industry. And so all of that is to say that you know fair value assumptions you know do not change very often and you know are not dictated by the current market. And then finally we have uh, economic values. So this is where we can take a company's actual servicing costs, you know, what um, their earning rate is on their you know escrows, for example. What how much it costs them to make advances, what yields they're looking for. So all of that can be used to, to generate, um, you know, put in our model and generate, say, cash flows that are going to be accurately reflecting that company's, again, the advances, their, their earnings, their servicing costs. And, you know, these uh, valuations can be crucial for clients to get a better understanding of their actual cash flows. And then on the, the next slide here, um, we actually can illustrate the difference between, you know, the fair value and the market value. And you can see the impact actually that the pandemic had on these values. So before the pandemic, you can see the green line, which it represents fair value here, is trending, you know, right below that red line, which are the SRP levels. However, you know, in March 2020, you can see that, you know, dramatic drop in SRP values at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and while you do see a fair value drop as well, you know, it's not nearly as volatile as the market value. And again, this is because, you know, fair value is not solely based on the market value. Uh, and, but with that, I'm, you know, going to pass it on to David to discuss um, some of the volatility around retain release execution. Hey, Natalie, before we move over to David, I do have a question that came in, and it's relative to the uh, post-pandemic. Did MCT um, see more servicers uh, increase their amount of retained uh, business uh, following the pandemic? You know, given the line that you just showed here, the SRP levels. So the question is really, did we see an uptick in the amount of retained business following the uh, the pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure David will talk uh, on this more with his slide as well, but um, that was definitely a big response because again, um, with the SRPs uh, dropping so much, it was really um, the only set thing that made sense was to start retaining. And we had a lot of clients uh, start retaining because of a response to the pandemic. Great. Thanks, Natalie. Over to you, David. You bet. No, that, that's absolutely right. Now, Bill, you opened up with talking about how important optionality was and the slide that Natalie just uh, showed us, you know, obviously capitalized on that. And many, many people got into servicing that never planned on it. And whether they liked the, to service or not, they certainly benefited from it one way or the other. Either they've kept it and they're continuing to get a great cash flow off of it, or they've sold it and have certainly reaped the benefits of that sale. So in any regard, it's been it's been a positive for folks that, that in general that went through that experience. The, I wanted to uh, take a minute to look at this slide about the retained released market, because in many cases we can get the idea that this market is fixed and really doesn't change much, but very much like the slide Natalie was showing, uh, values for MSR, really since the pandemic have been very uh, very volatile. They've, we, we've watched them move all the time. And so on this slide, what we're demonstrating is, is that even though the market, uh, the yellow line there is 63% uh, is a really, represents the number of best X decisions our clients are making to go with 
you know, an aggregator and release the loan and, and sell it away um, is 63%. Um, that number has adjusted dramatically really over the course of the last month. We've seen that release number go as high as 80. Uh, but what you are seeing is right now, the there's a lot of people retaining a lot more. So that it's interesting how quickly that market changes and how it just reflects how important it is to keep an eye on it. And certainly that's one of the things we focus on. We obviously can provide live MSR values for people to really track the market. So with those things, I want to go ahead and pass it back over to, uh, to Natalie. Thanks, David. So uh, next up, we're going to talk about some of the key you know, MSR value drivers. I, I'm going to go over a few, and then Azad's going to go over even more. Uh, but to start here, we do have you know, the different investor types and the various remittance types. So with the remittance types, we have actual actual, scheduled actual, and scheduled scheduled, and these really directly influence the value of the um, you know mortgage servicing rate due to the you know differing cash flow patterns and and the risk profiles associated with each type. Uh, so to start off here, we do have uh, actual actual, and that's going to be tied to the Fannie Mae investor. And in this remittance type, you know the servicer remits only the actual payments received from the borrowers. So if a borrower makes uh, late payments or defaults, the servicer is only going to forward what's been collected. So actual actual has lower operational risk for the servicers since you know they don't need to advance their own funds to miss payments, and, and this you know reduces the financial risk of you know the cost of servicing, and again and potentially increasing the value of the MSRs. However, you know since the cash flows are less predictable, you know they can be a discounted value due to that uncertainty. Next up, we have scheduled actual, and this is going to be tied to uh, the Freddie Mac investor. And this is where the servicer is required to remit the scheduled principal and interest payments to the investors, uh, regardless of whether those payments have been collected from the borrower. So if the borrower defaults or makes late payments, you know, the servicer must uh, make uh, advance those advancements, you know, to the scheduled amounts, uh, but they will be reimbursed for it later. So with Schedule Actual, this really uh, introduces more risk for the servicer compared to Actual Actual, you know, again, because of those obligations to advance those funds. Um, thus, this is increasing liquidity requirements and, you know, potential costs if the delinquencies uh, rise. So, you know, this higher risk can lead to the lower valuation of MSRs due to costs and financial restraints associated with those advances. You know, however, there is also potential for higher earnings as well here. So. The servicers can gain money on the number of days the principal and interest are being held um, before being remitted to the investors under this scheduled actual uh, remittance structure. So when the servicer collects payments from the borrowers, you know, but holds on to them for a certain number of days before remitting to the investor, a servicer can deposit those funds in an interest-bearing account. So, you know, those interests uh, earned during this period is called uh, is what are called flow income. And, you know, the longer the funds are held, the more interest the income the servicer can generate. Uh, additionally, you know, because schedule actual remittance, you know, is ensuring the schedule or payments, again, regardless of the actual borrower payments, this leads to more predictable cash flows, which can increase the, the value of the MSR. And then finally, we have scheduled scheduled. So this would be tied to, you know, Fannie and BS and, and the Jenny May investor. And so under this agreement, you know, the servicer is remitting the scheduled principal and interest payments to the investors, again, regardless of whether the payments are received from the borrower, just like scheduled actual. However, under scheduled schedule, the servicer must also um, make advances for other funds to cover delinquencies and shortfalls. So this includes, you know, the taxes and uh, insurance payments due to the escrow account, uh, meaning the servicer must ensure like the full payment is being made on time, regardless of any, you know, delays or defaults by the borrower. So, you know, therefore, scheduled schedule actually provides the most predictable cash flows, um, which can again be attractive and command a premium. However, the burden on the servicer is highest under scheduled schedule, and so this high level of responsibility and, and risk can lead to, you know, increased servicing costs and require more capital reserves, uh, potentially decreasing the MSR value there. Uh, next up, we also have state. So, you know, there are a, a number of factors on why state might cause different MSR values. So for one, you know, we do monitor prepayment speeds based on state. 
And we do see payment speeds can vary greatly depending on, um, you know, from state to state. Uh, foreclosure timelines is another one. Um, that is um, something else that can vary greatly from state to state. And, you know, with longer foreclosure timelines, you'll um, see uh, lower values for those MSRs. Uh, another one being uh, average UPV. So uh, for every negative in state, this could be another uh, major driver as, you know, higher average UPVs uh, can increase the value of the MSRs. And, and then finally, the economy of the state or the home prices uh, it would also be another uh, driver for the MSR values. And then finally, here we have a coupon. So the two main situations would be, you know, one, you know, if the current market rates are higher than the interest rate of the loan, the loan would be considered what we call in the money and the likelihood of a refinance is lower, and the value of the MSR is therefore higher. And then alternatively, uh, if a loan considered out of the money when the current market rate is lower than the uh, interest rate of the loan. Uh, therefore, there's a higher likelihood of the loan refinance, and, and then therefore the value of the MSR would be lower. Um, but with that, I'm gonna, gonna pass it on to Azad to go over you know, even more uh, key MSR drivers here. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, some of the other uh, core uh, variables that impact the value is the loan to value. Uh, uh, so the higher the LTV, that means the higher monthly payment uh, uh, because uh, uh, the borrower did not put enough down payment, therefore the monthly payment is going to go higher, and that could expose the loan to potential uh, delinquency. Uh, you know, the opposite of that, lower LTV, meaning lower payment, lesser uh, uh, delinquency uh, potential. However, those we found out through history, low LTV loans could mean faster prepayment because those borrowers will have higher, tend to have higher credit scores and tend to refinance and uh, for different reasons. Uh, the high equity build up within their uh, uh, property, or it just they see a better uh, option for themselves. The same thing with the FICO scores. FICO scores could impact uh, delinquency and prepayment behavior. Higher uh, credit score. A lot of companies, uh, they look at high score as a good thing, uh, and they are. Uh, they offer stability in terms of performance, However, at the same time, those borrowers could easily uh, change or refinance for the slightest change in interest rate. So those are the things to consider. Lower uh, scores tend to have uh, longer duration because those borrowers tend to stay put and not go anywhere. However, they could end up with higher delinquency as well. One of the things that we're seeing right now going back to uh, the UPB uh, is when you have the average UPB, just like uh, Natalie had mentioned in the state, those tend to have higher tax and insurance payments. So, and we recently started seeing more tax and insurance payment increases because of the high property values. And some states, just to give you an example, in Florida, for instance, where it's the home of the hurricanes, we saw uh, an average increase of about 20 to 25 percent every single year for the last three years, where in Georgia next door, we saw an average increase of about 10 to 15 percent increase. So if you add the three years, that total payment on the borrowers in Florida probably went up anywhere between 50 percent to 75 percent where it was three years ago. So that could definitely put a lot of strain on the borrowers and could push them into delinquency if they don't refinance uh, quick enough. Uh, the other uh, factor that could lead uh, to higher or lower value is the prevailing market interest rate. So whatever the 30 year prevailing 30 year mortgage interest rate, that could lead to lower prepayment or higher prepayment. So if, as mortgage rates increase, prepayment will decline, therefore the value will increase, and the opposite is true. When prepayment started to decline, prepay, I'm sorry, mortgage rates started to decline, prepayment started to increase, therefore the values will decrease. Uh, one of the leading 
value components of the entire MSR right after the service fee. Servicing fee income is the highest income component for any MSR. The second highest component is the escrow earning part of that. And as I talked about the monthly tax and insurance, and as you, uh, the borrowers make their own payments, that payment, the tax and insurance payment, sits in an escrow account. And depending on your banking relationship, you could earn some interest on that. And we saw some levels uh, recently as high as 5% and as low as 3% annualized. So that makes up about 20 to 30% of the entire MSR value. So we're seeing a lot of value gain uh, over the last two years because of that. But now as the Fed start talking about cutting um, fund rate, that could decline a little bit, and we could expect to see a 50% decline from the peak, which was about 5%. So that could end up somewhere around 3 to 2.5%. So that value could get impacted because of that. The interest rate on advances. Even if you choose an investor remittance like the Fannie Mae cash flow, I'm sorry, Fannie Mae cash window, uh, basically, if the borrower defaults, you don't have to advance that principal interest. However, the servicer will always be on the hook for the tax and insurance advances because for different reasons, maybe the borrower's fault or maybe the state or the insurance company raised their rate, therefore the servicer probably didn't collect enough to meet those levels. So as a servicer, you have to advance that shortfall until you collect it back from the borrower. And in most cases, you have to borrow and pay interest on those borrowings to cover those shortfalls um, that you will experience. And also for remittances uh, such as Fannie Mae MBS or Jenny Mae, if the borrower does not make a mortgage payment as a servicer, you have to advance that principal and interest payment. And most likely you have to borrow to pay those advances. And again, that will add to the cost of your services. Uh, next slide, please. Prepayments. Uh, it, it, prepayments really is one of the most critical components of valuing an MSR. Uh, it's the biggest driver to any MSR value. And that volatility depends on many factors. The interest rate environment we're in, the economy, geographic location, uh, home prices, all those things will dictate how borrowers will behave uh, in, in terms of prepayment. Uh, we're experiencing some of the lowest prepayment we've ever experienced in the industry. We saw a low of 2.5% about a year ago but that kind of started to reverse itself and we're seeing somewhere right now around four, 5%, even for low WAC loans that were originated back in 2020, at three, three and a half percent. Uh, we expect those prepayment levels to increase somewhere to close to 6% heading into 2025. And, and the reason for that is the consumer debt level rising, home prices are appreciating, Economy is good, so a lot of borrowers will opt out and refinance probably, even though we're seeing limited uh, activity, but that could change with the Fed lowering their rates. So those are the things that we have to look at. And also, it impacts uh, the bulk trades. So when we have an MSR offering, uh, that dictates, the prepayment forecast dictates what that value is. And we're seeing a lot of it right now. A lot of the brokers or a lot of the buyers are forecasting very low prepayment forecast, therefore pushing the values uh, into multiples higher than five, for, uh, five multiple of servicing fee. Uh, another factor is the discount rate. Discount rate is basically, you can look at it as a risk measure for that asset you're holding. 
if it's a Fannie Mae actual, actual, or Fannie Mae MBS, or basically any agency, uh, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, those are low risk because of the credit, uh, credit requirement is very strict. Therefore, the risk of default or risk of the prepayment is low. So we would use a lower discount rate somewhere between 9 to 10%. Currently, they're on 9.5%. For Jenny, on the other side, there's more delinquency risk than agency loans. Therefore, we would use uh, a discount rate somewhere between 10.5 to 12.5. And depending on the portfolio size and the originator, we're currently seeing somewhere uh, close to 12%. The average UPB, we talked about the average UPB. The higher the UPB, obviously, you have higher servicing fee income. But again, that could uh, have the opposite effect of higher prepayment risk or higher default risk because of the higher monthly payment the borrower will have to make. So those are the things will dictate some of the measures you have to consider when you're conducting your business. Should I pursue higher average UPB or lower average UPB. Uh, we're seeing some uh, longer duration for loans with average UPB of about 200,000 versus uh, 300,000. 300,000 is more, they have more propensity uh, to prepay than a lower average UPB of about uh, uh, 200,000. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to share with you uh, what I just described about mortgage rates and float rates. So you can see the blue line is the Freddie Mac average weekly 30-year uh, mortgage rate. And then the red line is the one-year treasury rate that is basically used for float income rate. Back in 20, before the uh, COVID, uh, it was as high as 2.5%. And uh, during COVID, that went almost to zero, if not zero at times. But then uh, right after 2022, with inflation peaking, the Fed started raising rates. Uh, we saw that rate, float income rate, rise as high as 5% or slightly above 5%. But the risk of a downturn is very high right now. So if all economists, projections hold true, we should expect that float income rate to come down at least to about 3% level, maybe 2.5% before pandemic level. So if that happens, we should expect a decline in value somewhere between 10 to 15 basis points, roughly half a multiple uh, on average uh, for any uh, given loan. Uh, with that, I would turn it to David to talk about some additional MSR considerations. Thanks, Azad. I appreciate that. Yeah, the um, with the as we've been describing, really the the importance of MSR in people's profitability has been dramatic since COVID. It's also and also the, there's been volatility there. And as many new managers to MSR have come into the market, the, they're, uh, the big, a lot of what they've been wrestling with is really how to handle and manage this asset appropriately. Because sometimes they end up with high, a very high values on their valuations for their portfolio, and then the values drop, and then they're looking at a write-off, and they're trying to figure all that out. But one of the things that we've put together here is really something to uh, we have seen um, and we have been talking to our client base about really to help them stabilize their values. And that is we've, we've noticed kind of like this pieces parts um, uh, mentality or, or kind of management in the, in the MSR space. So in other words, they're getting pricing grids from one location, they're getting uh, their valuations done in another location, and then they're figuring out a whole different thing value to come up with to book their loans once the loan sale is made. And what we've realized is uh, the clients that we've talked to that we can kind of help them um, really normalize the cycle, so to speak, keep a uh, consistent approach throughout their the grids that they use to price with, the way that they book the loan, then by the time that it comes up for valuation purposes, then you, you really already ahead of time kind of know where you are. 
And this, and clearly, what we focus on here is fair value. And the reason is, is because you to help you not go from these highs and lows in the marketplace. And that's one of the things that we've noticed is, um, and we bring to our clients' attention, which is most people, most aggregators price with a with an SRP value, which is certainly what we would consider on the MSR side more of a market value. And they have a lot of reasons for pricing the way that they do that don't enter into your business model whatsoever. And people have a hard time understanding all the time how can they pay that particular multiple for something when you know I, I can't see it. It's because they have many other drivers driving their business model than they do yours. So I really would like you to take a look at this slide in some detail because we have found that stability starts with the way that you price your MSR and then the way you book it at the time of loan sale. And then that naturally leads into stability when you go to get a valuation. So with that piece, I want to move on to the next slide, but also invite Bill to, to kind of join me for some of these additional MSR comments. So Bill, do you have any other comments to make on the last slide I made, or do you want to just jump in here? Well, it's certainly something that we've been seeing a lot more of, David, over the last couple of quarters, that inconsistency around um, how they're mark to marking the asset, how the street rates are being established, and then getting um, sort of mismatch information, uh, leveraging SRP levels, which are actually, you know, uh, market level. So uh, having that continuity is something that uh, you know we've uh, talked a lot about, and uh, I'm sure that uh, it'll, it'll it'll continue. Yeah. Well, and the next uh, the thanks, Bill. Um, and the next uh, comment that's on here is is retain release volatility. Really touched on that on the earlier slide. We we mark this month out weekly within our own customer base of over 340 clients. We measure you know, the retain release execution every week. So it's something that we watch all the time and we're watching the volatility that exists in that. And many people are learning how to take advantage of the changes in MSR values in the way that they price and book their loans. So just something to consider as you, as you dig deeper into uh, your MSR strategies. So Bill, yeah, as far as the necessity for granular MSR pricing, uh, the, the market is dictating that. Historically, it's been very common for servicers, uh, seller servicers, to uh, price and uh, the build out rate sheet based on a static multiple. And historically, the number has been a four to one multiple that, uh, you know, 25 basis points in servicing is worth a point in, in price. But given how competitive the market is, you all know that it's a fiercely competitive market. And the MSR is a part of the price that needs to be considered strategically. So that granular pricing, basically what that means is every loan has its own value from an MSR perspective. And if you're applying a four to one a multiple across all of your product types and all of your FICOs and all of your geographies, then you're mispricing in most, in most cases where that individual loan might actually be worth 410 or it might be worth 390. But the bottom line is it's probably not worth four to one. And therefore, if you want to sort of maintain your competitive position and price your loans in a prudent way, in a more strategic way, that granular MSR pricing certainly needs to be a part of the strategy. So with that, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so the next one is strategies to minimize volatility and balance sheet disruptions. The We've highlighted on a couple of these topics so far, but Really, the um, we really advocate people looking at fair value or the center point of value for their MSR, and this th gives them the ability to uh, protect themselves moving forward. And so, fair value use in the way that they price, value value use in the way that they go about uh, getting their valuations and handling their valuations. Un unfortunately, we've watched way too many times people really try to take advantage of what the market volatility would provide on the upside, not to take into account, obviously, the rebound and where it goes when the rubber band snaps back. So what we really do is we've had a great track record with our clients, really keeping them in the center of the road and minimizing volatility uh, due to that. So 
um, certainly something to think about as you price and value your portfolios. So Bill, I'll turn that back to you. Yeah, what's interesting about this next one as far as effectively managing MSR portfolio prepayment speed, that's not something that we have focused on since uh, early 2020. You know, speeds have been historically low, but what's also interesting about that, just what's happened with rates over the last few weeks, it's going to become something that we'll need to start monitoring a lot more closely. You know, up over since 2020, uh, the speeds have not been necessarily a, a concern, but principal pay down uh, impact has been a concern. You know, given the fact that the interest rates have been so low, uh, the vast majority of the, the principal payment is actually bringing down those principal balances of MSR portfolios. And that was a little bit of a blind spot for most servicers. Many of them questioned, you know, why is my, my value going down? Because my right. prepay speeds are literally nothing. And the reason for that was just because of the principal pay down. It was just their, the, the balances were, were shrinking. In order to maintain that, they needed to add more production to the, uh, to the portfolio to really maintain that, that franchise value. Um, as far as the uh, in the money production, I think as odd might have mentioned this and, uh, and Natalie as well, um, given what's happened with rates over the last couple of weeks, uh, that's something that uh, portfolio managers will have to take another look at. You know, what do you have on the balance sheet that's actually exposed to prepayment? So that's uh, just over the last you know two, three weeks is something that we're going to have to take a much uh, closer current uh, look at. And then the net tangible benefit. Uh, this is something that the uh, the investors and the GSEs monitor very closely. Uh, are your speeds similar to your peer? And if they're not similar to your peer, what's going on? Do you have a strategy where your loan officers are able to refinance borrowers where their rate goes down an eighth? You know, and that's going to be much faster than your peer. Or do you have a, a net tangible benefit policy that requires the borrower's payment to go down a certain amount? And if it does, then your speeds will be, uh, you know, in line with your peer. So, again, that net tangible benefit impact is something that, uh, just given what's happened over the last couple of weeks, is something that we'll be uh, taking an, another look at over the next, uh, you know, couple of quarters. So with that, David, I'll send it back over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, recapture strategy has really been a big topic for quite some time. Um, and this is really one of the places when you're looking at your aggregator pricing and you're wondering why it's, you know, they get so much more value or place so much more value there than than maybe you would on, on the way that you would price. It's really the recapture strategy that um, some of the larger uh, investors have in place. And so they, they really count on trying to keep a loan two, three, five uh, times and turn it over. Uh, and talking with them, that's their actual strategy. So, um, and un unless you really have a recapture strategy built into play, it's really hard to add any value to your MSR valuations for that. Um, so it's something for you to think about and how that fits into the overall picture of how you manage your portfolio. But to Bill's point, you, if you want to increase your values, uh, then you certainly have to start adding production into that, um, into your current portfolio for those values to be maintained. MSR values usually peak in a loan around year four. So we're certainly reaching that with the uh, 2021 um, production. So then the last thing real quick is how does this all impact bulk activity right now? Well, there's a very interesting paradigm going on in the bulk market at the moment, and it's really driven by the fact that there's a limited amount of origination in the market. And so what? And so the the Pied Piper that always has to be paid is runoff. And so every major servicer experiences 10 to 20 percent runoff every year, and their issue is is that they have to fill up that capacity. And we talked to many buyers during the middle of the summer. And most of them were 40, 50 percent, even greater than that, behind on their buying. And so, and then the other part is, is that while there were a lot of packages out on the street to be sold in Q1, Q2 and Q3 have been much slower in terms of packages going out. But the interesting part is, because of the demand, the pricing has been outstanding. So it's it's been one of the best markets really throughout the year that that we've had in some time. Most most years in the past have really been Kind of a quarter by quarter but this year relatively speaking has been very strong so if you have a uh if you have been considering selling a portfolio 
uh, we would certainly tell you now is the time to do it. I think the obvious thing to watch for is as rates continue to come down. So we do think that opportunity runs out, but you're, you know, it's probably something to heavily consider in the next 30 days. So with that, I'll wrap it up and pass back to Bill. Yeah, and we do have a question, Azad, if you could come back on uh, that I'm going to ask you to address. Uh, thank you, David. A nice uh, summary there. Azad, the, the question is, um, what are we seeing currently in, in the market relative to MSR financing? Is it increasing, de decreasing, and, and why? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Actually, we're seeing uh, the trend right now is uh, higher MSR financing. We're seeing a lot of companies uh, pulling away from warehouse lending for different reasons, and uh, they get better execution uh, from the MSR value uh, because, I mean, the interest rate they have to pay when they finance MSR is somewhere between 5% and 7% in some cases. It actually, I'd say probably half of the cases, but they get to finance up to 70% of the overall value that they carry at, uh, at any given point. So we're seeing a lot of trends, and actually we're seeing a lot of those banks who offer financing move over to MSR financing as well. We're seeing a new entrance uh, you know, from non-banks into financing MSR. So that's the trend right now. And the reason for that, uh, MSR owners and financiers realize MSR values are at their peak and they have higher values and there's a great opportunity in that. So it's definitely a win-win situation. Owning MSR, uh, you know, help keep operations steady. At the same time, they could finance it if they have to, to offset some expenses or originate new business. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Azad. So I'm just going to close Thanks. it out here with some, some, some final thoughts on MSR 101, um, just a few takeaways. So number one, the MSR asset contributes to building franchise value. It's certainly important to understand the advantages and disadvantages, but it's a valuable asset. Uh, secondly, optionality is, is critical. Uh, it gives you the ability to pivot depending on market conditions. That flexibility uh, can make or break a company in, in different, uh, you know, different market scenarios. Um, MSR is a natural cross edge uh, relative to production revenue. So as production is declining and revenue is shrinking, uh, typically just given what's happening with interest rate, the value of that MSR asset is climbing. It's a relatively liquid asset. It can be bought and sold, you know, with GSD approval. It also can be leveraged in the form of MSR financing, as uh, as I just uh, articulated. And it's not an all or nothing uh, scenario. I mean, you can retain some and release some. It's really uh, depending on your strategic objectives. And then finally, um, MS, uh, MCT has the, the resources, the expertise, and the technology uh, to support your strategic objectives. So we'd love to hear from you. Hope uh, you picked up a few things during this session. Uh, we're available, um, and uh, please uh, reach out. Uh, good luck uh, through this uh, this cycle. And uh, again, thank you all for uh, for joining us.